1523, Martin Luther, in his treatise on governmental authority, declared that the question of whether or not the Christian should bear arms on behalf of the state should be left to the other group, the non-Christians. Luther concluded that it was, quote, very beneficial and essential for the whole world and for your neighbor. Therefore, if you see that there's a lack of hangmen, constables, judges, lords, or princes, and you find that you are qualified, you should offer your services and seek the position that the essential governmental authority may not be despised and become enfeebled become weaker, lest the government should perish. Almost 400 years later, the Russian writer Tolstoy, in his aptly titled, The Kingdom of God is Within You, famously stated, the sole meaning of life is to serve humanity by contributing to the establishment of the kingdom of God. These works have propagated the false notion that the kingdom of God has come. Therefore, they say it is your Christian duty to become involved in politics, the military, or at the very least in social justice endeavors in order to continue to, quote, spread the kingdom of God on earth, as some put it today. Tolstoy's book was named after one of the most used verses to advance this view, and that's Luke 17, verse 21. But the context clearly contradicts this erroneous view. For example, in verse 20 of Luke 17, it says the Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God would come. Jesus answered, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you, Many other translations and paraphrases render that last phrase as the kingdom of God is inside you. That's from the Worldwide English and J.B. Phillips New Testament paraphrase. Or God's kingdom is here with you. The contemporary English and the easy to read versions. There's even a footnote in the CEV that says on this verse, or the kingdom, that is, is in your hearts. This forcing of what some call dominion or kingdom now theology destroys the fact that in the original New Testament Greek, present tense verbs sometimes have a future meaning. So we see in Luke 17 verse 24, for example, that the coming of the kingdom, says Jesus, will be like lightning flashing across the sky. That is, it's a very much universally visible and not invisible event. The disciples even asked Jesus at the end of Luke 17, where will they, that is the people Jesus has been talking about, be taken to? The same use of this Greek present tense verb with a future meaning appears earlier in the so-called Beatitudes of Matthew. Now, even though there's a present dimension to the kingdom in verses like Matthew 5, verse 3 and 10, when Jesus says, theirs is the kingdom, the context shows its future application. In Matthew 5, 4, Jesus says, they will be comforted. And in Matthew 5, 5, he famously said, they will inherit the earth. That is, the future kingdom on earth will finally belong to them. The same is true for other verses. In Matthew 21, verse 31, where Jesus says that tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God. That's because, as Jesus goes on to explain in verse 32, the tax collectors and prostitutes believed the Baptist's preaching about the coming kingdom of God. Note that earlier in Luke chapter 3, verse 9, the Baptist warned the people about an impending doom by saying that the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, said the Baptist, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. We can compare this present yet future meaning of kingdom texts with what the New Testament says 
about your own salvation. Even though the majority of references describe your salvation as a future event, the New Testament also sees your salvation as a past. You were saved, says Paul in Ephesians 2 verse 8, and present. You are being saved in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 8. It's a process. In the book, The Coming Kingdom by Dr. Andrew Woods, says that Jesus' ministry was, quote, characterized by perpetual promises of a future earthly kingdom. In verses like Matthew 19, 28, where Jesus says to his disciples, Truly I say to you, you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And Matthew 26, verse 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Dr. Woods continues by saying that a terrestrial geopolitical element is always included in the Old Testament's presentation of the kingdom. Such an abrupt change from understanding the kingdom as encompassing this physical reality to solely a spiritual reality is tantamount to hermeneutically changing horses in midstream. Why would Christ or any of the New Testament writers, for that matter, introduce such a radical transition without any in-depth commentary explaining that such a transition was underway? Now, that's a very good question for all of us to ponder.